The 805 Focus is brought to you in part by Nonprofit Connect. Nonprofit Connect provides superior leadership tools and resources so nonprofit leaders and board members can make valuable decisions to move their organization forward to a sustainable and vibrant future. More information on services online at nonprofitconnect.org. Welcome everyone to 805 Focus. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits. So get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is Chris Goldblatt, and Chris is with the Fish Reef Project. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. So Thanks nervous. so much for being with us. It's wonderful to be back. Oh, yeah. yeah. I enjoyed our last interview. I learned so many things, and I can hardly wait because I know you have a lot of new information to share with us. I do. It's been an eventful two years. So since I was here last, we've made a couple laps around the world, making oh, reefs gosh. in different places around the world, and right here at home. So, like, what, where have you been? Well, locally, uh, we're very proud that we worked with the local Girl Scouts to make really? a reef in Lake Kachuma, if you can oh. believe that. It was at the peak of the drought, and there was really nowhere for the fish to live. So the Girl Scouts took the lead, Oh man! and they contacted us and said, why don't, why don't we make a reef out there? And so they, they reached out, and we did the Lemon Fest together to raise awareness, and they helped us build the reefs and came out there when we deployed it, and now they're their home and habitat to all kinds of fish out there. That's so great, and they learned so much doing they did. that. They did, and it's a role that traditionally falls to the Boy Scouts, so we're proud there was a Girl Scout. Alrighty then. Yeah. Yeah, good job, and where else have you been? Well, way off in Papua New Guinea. Golly. Which, which is that archipelago above Australia, and it's a fascinating place because the majority of the population um, still lives off the land and the ocean, so they really have this deep interconnected relationship with the marine resources of the region. So they need their reefs to be healthy and thriving for food security so, so they can continue to basically feed their families. And it's fascinating because it's probably one of the most biodiverse places in the world. Yeah, You have so many different kinds of corals and fish, some of which have yet to been uh, described by science. Uh -huh. um, and it's fascinating because there's, there's no coral bleaching. You see oh. in a lot of places like Hawaii and, uh -huh. and other places where the coral turns white when you have uh, double El Ninos where the water's warm mm -hmm. year in, year out, where the little polyp, the little animal inside dies. And you don't see that in Papua New Guinea. So it's a wonderful place to make reefs because you know that they're gonna be healthy and well. And we exchange making reefs uh, uh, with the tribes there uh, to help them, to encourage them not to use dynamite anymore oh, to fish on the reefs. Yeah, and it's dynamite. very successful. They stop dynamite fishing in places and the coral just thrives. Wow, so what did the Papua New Guinea tribes think about mm. Americans coming to help save their reefs? Well, th there's, there's a funny thing that happens when, when one group of fishermen, uh, which is uh, at least 50% uh, of what our organization is, we, you know, we are fishermen, uh, but we like to consider ourselves hunter-gatherers in the same light that they are. Mm -hmm. People getting their food from nature to feed ourselves in the most organic way possible. So they do the same thing. So we really connected on a very deep level and they were very accepting of, of what we had to offer. Gosh, mm -hmm. well that's good. That's mm -hmm. really good. Indeed. So, you know, I heard you talking earlier about sort of the natural process of the rocks and the boulders coming down to create the reef and um, it, here in Santa Barbara, mm -hmm, indeed. and also how it's a, it's a great research place for UCSB. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, because I found that fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's um, a little known fact. Uh, it's obvious when you think about it, though. Uh, Santa Barbara is an interesting place, because the, the seafloor is mostly mud out here. It's sort of a shale-based ecosystem. Um, it's frankly why there's a lot of oil out in the channel because that, that shale becomes oil. Oh. But you don't have a lot of uh, what you call high relief structure, which are big ledges uh, for things to grow off of. You do off of Isla Vista, you do off Henry's Beach, but the mm -hmm. rest of it's mostly mud. And historically there was a kelp forest that was a thousand feet wide that went from El Capitan all the way to Carpinteria. Oh, it was golly. one of the biggest kelp forests anywhere in the world. And it is gone, with, with, except, with rare exception, there are a few remnants. 
It's gone. It's gone. And it provides so many benefits, or what you call ecosystem services, which are all the different ways that it benefits the ecosystem and mankind. And the reason, or one of the primary reasons why it's gone is the rocks that normally come off the mountains, the, the granite type rocks or the sandstone type rocks, um, during flood episodes like we had here in 2017, their ultimate destiny is supposed to be the ocean. Oh. And that's where the basis for our, for our kelp forests come from here in Santa Barbara and Carpinteria areas, is the boulders make it to the sea, or some of them are supposed to make it to the sea for the small little phytoplankton, the baby kelp, to settle on and grow. But humans, we put houses in the way, oh, we gosh. put roads in the way, we put fences in the way. So a lot of those boulders don't make it out to sea anymore. So you don't have anything for the kelp to grow on. And then year in, year out, it silts over and you lose your kelp forest. And that's where we are. So what we're doing is with the help of the county, the county's been supportive by donating all of those boulders from the horrific flood that we had in 2017 that, was, that impacted us yeah, all. Yeah. And they're helping to transport those to Goleta Pier and we're gonna put those boulders in Goleta Bay as a place for the kelp to grow and thrive. And from that, we're going to get a huge amount of local sustainable seafood out of it. Um, the kelp buffers the ocean acid levels. It actually pulls the carbon dioxide out of the water. And so the, the calcium-based life forms like the clams and the scallops mm -hmm. and the, anything mm -hmm. with a shell, it doesn't suffer from ocean acidification within the kelp forest. It sequesters carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, it helps the beach become wider because it, it manages the currents. And we can bring back that entire kelp forest with just this very basic technology. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, how long do you think that'll take? Well, we're already starting the permitting process. We have all the political alignment. We have support from UCSB. That's, that's going to be deal. a major beneficiary because they're going to, going to be able to study that for generations. You have to remember these last 500, 600 years. So in terms of a, a nominal cost to make them, the benefit in terms of cost to benefit for society in the ocean, when you look out over 600 years, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if you want to calculate it in, yeah. in, in terms of dollars and cents. You know, and earlier you were talking about how, you know, really we're talking about long time periods mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. But, and so some people might say, well, why bother to go to this trouble? Because it's not going to affect all that many years. And you said, well, you know, it's important not to have hubris. And it's important to take care of our garden right now, right here. It, it's true. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's funny because there's two sides of the environmental equation. I get asked this all the time. That one side throws up their hands and they say it's all over, the ocean's sick and dying, why bother doing anything? Mm. That's one side. And then the other side is people that want to manipulate the entire situation. Yeah. And um, I think uh, it's important that we show young people um, that you can make a difference through direct action, basically. Oh. Um, it's, it's important not to think too much of yourself as a species that the ultimate outcome is going to go its way no matter what you do. But it is, um, it is okay to tend to the garden in the meantime. That is great. And I yeah. love the focus on the young people, which would explain why you worked with the Girl Scouts and indeed. the Boy Scouts before that. Yeah, 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 indeed. And, and you get that all over the world. People are so happy when they find out that there are real solutions because in Santa Barbara and Montecito, um, it, it is a fairly well-heeled community. But sadly, we have one of the sickest, most anemic, least productive oceans, not only in California, but in the entire world. Is that right? Yeah. I it, bet people don't know that. It, it's a tragedy. It really is a tragedy. It doesn't have to be that way when the solutions are, frankly, very viable and very doable. So that's a big deal. Why are people not talking about it? And why are, why are we not looking for solutions? It, in addition to what you're doing? Uh, again, because people give in to apathy. Um, when it comes to, to um, solution-based projects, people are afraid of coming out of their comfort zone because they have to be measured in the end. Oh. But they have to take a chance. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, and so that is, in effect, what the Fishery Project does, is we take a chance on behalf of the community. Uh, and we're, we're not afraid to be measured effectively. We say, you know, we're asking for you to donate. Um, a, a fairly substantial amount of money to make it t initially a 200 acre kelp forest off of Goleta. We're going to start with a very small pilot project of just two acres to prove the concept and rebuild that entire kelp corridor all the way down that, that, that frankly 
um, is our birthright because it's a historic kelp bed that was mapped all the way back to 1912 in high definition by the U.S. Geologic Survey. Yeah. Wow. How long do you think it took that kelp bed to, like, how long ago was it viable? Uh, it, well, when you look at the aerial photos at the library in UCSB, it started to peter out about when, uh, you know, you built the harbor, you built the road, and then when all the houses went in effectively and it stopped the, the migration of those boulders. So around the late 50s, you start, to see oh. it, you start to see it peter out. The kelp used to be so thick in front of the harbor that you had to cut the kelp to get the boats out. Oh gosh. That's how, that's how thick it was. And, and it's, just, it's just not there. It's missing in action, along with all of the other animals that rely on it. You know, I remember taking my kayak out in uh, Carpinteria, mm -hmm. and there was an area that was really, really thick with mm -hmm. kelp. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember, like, how do I get through this stuff? Mm -hmm. And now that you mention it, I notice that it's hardly anything there. Yeah, yeah, now. exactly. I mean, you have to compensate for warm years like we've had to where the kelp gets naturally weaker. So you can't mm -hmm. blame it all on habitat. But as humans, we have an obligation to do what we have the capacity to do. And nature's given us this great gift where the, the little baby kelp, the little mm -hmm. baby seaweed, the phytoplankton, floats around and it's everywhere out there. And it just needs a home to settle on, which is what reef material is, in this case, native quarry rock that we're going to put on the sea floor, huh. which would have ended up there anyway if humans basically weren't in the way of it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, and if you look at the giant mesh fence that, that uh, the local citizens put up uh, at the foothills right. of Montecito, right, right. understandably so. But that does sort of seal the fate that those rocks aren't going to end up in the ocean. Oh. So the fish reef project stepped out in front and said, well, we'll go ahead and, and put those rocks in the ocean for you in a choreographed way that, that maximizes the benefit to the kelp forest and all of the little critters such as lobster and abalone and scallops and fish that, that uh, we all depend on and need. So where are you going to get more boulders when these run out? I think it'll be a while until they run out. Oh, okay. Uh, but they do come, there, there's a number of natural quarries in, in California. Oh, there are. Yeah, the east end of Catalina. Um, in, in some cases, they've uh, even come from uh, Baja, Mexico in some cases. But we also make designed uh, reef units out of marine concrete that have a, a special pH that allows the marine oh, life to settle. Okay. So in the event that there's not enough quarry rock, we, we have um, man-made materials that, that emulate and simulate what quarry rock would do. Oh, mm -hmm. gosh. Well, okay. Um, we have a little bit of time left. Mm -hmm. What else would you like to tell your audience? Well, I would just like to encourage my fellow Santa Barbarians and the folks from Montecito to step out of their comfort zone on this one. So I think it's, I think it's fair to, to sort of call us out as, as, as a society and say that yeah. you don't necessarily need... Uh, another thing. You don't need another Rolex. You don't need another Bentley. You don't need another foyer in the backyard. What you do need is a healthy ocean. Yes. As a community. And we'll do that for you. That is a really important point. Yeah. You know, people move here. Oh, look at this beautiful ocean. Let's build a house. Let's build another house. Let's build a bunch of houses. And then forget about taking care of the ocean. Exactly. So, so we do ask that, that people step up and reach out to us and enjoy a charitable contribution and, and okay. we will make those reefs and we'll restore the All ocean right. to its maximum health. And I know that your website is playing on the bottom of the screen and so people can go to that website mm -hmm. and they can donate mm -hmm. uh, financially. Maybe they can find other ways to help there. Sure, indeed. Good. Reach out. All right. We can't wait to hear from everybody. Great. Yeah. Well, Chris, thanks so much for being with us. Thank we appreciate that. And we appreciate all the good work you're doing. Thank you, Cinder. We'll be back in a couple of years when, uh, when the reef's made and we'll have lots of pictures of fish and kelp to share with you. Sounds great. Yeah. And thank you for joining us on 805 Focus, and we'll see you next time.